There we go. All right, and welcome to those of you who are joining us on YouTube as well. My name is Jamie Vivak, and I am the Will County Director for the Conservation Foundation. Just so you know, everyone is muted, your cameras are off because we are in webinar format here. And we are currently recording, as I mentioned. So these will be on our YouTube channel. Um, I usually have them up within a day. So please definitely check us out on YouTube. Give us a like or a follow or whatever YouTube calls that. Um, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box that lets everybody see your questions. And it also makes it easier for us to find them all at the end because sometimes can, uh, questions can sometimes get lost in the chat. So we'll make sure to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. For your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in the chat, but just in case I missed a setting or somebody gets in there, please don't click links other than what I might post. On the TCF side of things, these webinars are offered to the public for free. However, we do encourage you to consider a donation or membership as you're planning your end of year giving with that extra tax incentive I just heard that we're getting this year for donations. Um, please do consider dropping us a, a donation, becoming a member. The more people we have attending these, the more it does cost us to run them. So at the very end of the webinar, you're gonna be taken to a screen with lots of resources and things that you might be interested in, including our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying the webinars, I encourage you to donate. That helps to keep us running. So we also have a variety of members only stuff. You'll get our newsletter to find out more about webinars and, and what we've got coming up because I have some awesome ones I've been planning for you guys in the new year. So keep an eye out for those. So. Um, and to sweeten the deal, we are actually taking part, we have a matching grant going right now. So we hit our $75,000 target and our donor was gracious enough to now bump it up to $100,000. So through the end of the year, all new donations we get are doubled. So if you donate $25, we actually end up with $50. So this is a great time to donate if you've been thinking about it. As I mentioned, we've been doing these every week during the shutdown. Um, and we're gonna continue doing them for the time being, um, at least until you guys stop attending. So don't stop attending. Uh, upcoming webinars next week will be the last webinar of the year. We'll be taking a break for the holidays. Um, but Wednesday, December 16th, Nature Stories and How to Tell Them will be joined by Brandon Hayes, uh, who is a fantastic communicator and, and a great storyteller. And so he's got some cool stories. I was trying to think of like, what would be a good end of year holiday theme? And I, I think, you know, I just get the image of telling stories around a, a, a campfire or a fireplace. Um, just has a very holiday feel to it. So Brandon's gonna be telling us some stories as well as some tips on how you can tell better stories yourself. So uh, join us again, one o'clock next week as well for that. Without further ado, I am going to turn it over to photographer extraordinaire, my friend, Terry Measley. Terry is going to tell us all about the insect world today through his fabulous photography. Hi, thanks for uh, having me out to host this. The uh, presentation I'm going to do is, is focused on my yard this time around. I've got tons of photos from various prairies and reconstructions and such, but this time it's all on the yard. Uh, and what I've been able to detract. So I'm going to start the presentation here. Here we go. And you'll notice right away my formatting screwed up. Zoom has um, done something, but most of it looks okay. So off we go. So I'm an amateur at this. Uh, this is not my profession. I get out there and I do photography and some reporting of data, say at Fermilab and some other places. I've uh, owned this house since 2000 and I contribute to a bunch of citizen science stuff and things that have lost off this slide is I identify bees for bee spotter and um, am involved with some folks from a couple of different universities and places like that. So that's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot over the last 20 years. Uh, even more so over the last just 10 years. The goals of the yard, and I think I needed to have a set of goals for the yard. I wanna do a bunch of different things with it. You know, it has to have spots for us, for the dogs, for wildlife, and these things can all coexist. 
Um, I also want to reduce the impact on the watershed. We live right along the Fox River. Um, the creek, one of the um, tributary creeks runs through our neighbor's yard. And um, the river has been in our yard numerous times. It will flood again, so we have to be flood tolerant. I also want to be a good example. I want to show what people can do. People walk past and see just there's always color in this yard. Something is always blooming. And I'm always willing to talk to people about that. I'm going to give you a quick tour of the back. Here's three of the dogs. The fourth one is probably causing trouble somewhere. She's a younger husky. So three Malamute, one Malamute, three huskies. They're in the shade of a couple of pagoda dogwoods. Um, they were here when we got here. They had been pruned down to be shrubs and I have decided just to let them grow tall. I'm going to keep pruning underneath so we can move around beneath them. Um, in the back beyond that, that uh, wagon, there is a little vegetable garden that has been fenced off from the dogs and from uh, deer and such. The pavers you see were added a couple of years ago when we did a major renovation on this yard. Um, those are permeable pavers. They have the gaps between them with that uh, gravel that sits in there and it really works. We've had some torrential downpours and um, it just, it seeps right in. There was a good gravel base there beforehand, which really helped a lot. So you can see a little turnaround here um, in the driveway and then how the native plantings are, are um, organized is their border. So their border along the driveway, their border around the entire uh, perimeter of the yard. Um, that is a Norway, uh, Norway, um, Maple you see there, there's another one that shades the house. Um, I should get rid of them, but I just can't. Um, there's a wild, uh, there's a sour cherry tree here. Uh, in one of the floods, the big flood we had a few years ago, the record flood, uh, we lost a mature sour cherry tree, which really hurt. We lost a couple of lilacs, which didn't hurt at all, um, but it allowed us to uh, see what lived. And that's what it looks like. The yard is kind of a mess. I'm constantly fighting creeping Charlie and such. Dandelions I don't care about. Clover's fine. Um, those aren't necessarily native, but they're a good resource for everything. And you can see some of the Zizia golden Alexanders, the um, geranium and such just starting to grow here. And that's a white oak you see in the center. Along the corner there, you can see another white oak a swamp oak that should handle the, the water. That's a big pussy willow there as well. Um, and it, I think in that flood, the water was up to uh, the little rise you see here for about 10 days, that area sat underwater. Um, that pussy willow, I think grew three feet in that time. It just loved that water. Um, the two larger shrubs you see there are elderberries. They have since been removed. They were just too big for the area. Um, there's button bush and some other stuff back there. This is my problem area. I can never seem to get this area under control. I know it looks like it's under control, but when everything is growing, it's not. Uh, there's a ton of wild geranium and such that just take over back there. And besides my finger, you can see uh, Zizia is starting to pop here. These were taken in early May. So you see various things going there. I'm letting violets grow. Violets are a host plant for I want to see, for one of the butterflies, and I don't remember which. Um, and they're a good early resource and they look pretty while you can see them. My goal here is to have something blooming year round. Well, until it gets cold. Uh, these are Jacob's ladders, little plants that draw a lot of attention from our early pollinators. Uh, they die down by early summer and other things grow past them. I wanna get some ephemeral plants in, some of the spring ephemeral plants in as well. So I've got some bellflowers here. I've got, uh, I think, Right next to that bellflower is a um, Jacob's a um, Solomon seal that's coming up. Uh, the Solomon seals, they have fruited every year. Um, something comes along and eats them. I haven't been able to grab the fruit 
to get seeds out of it to try to plant it, but they keep coming back, so they're well established. In spring, um, everything starts to green up. Uh, these little bees and wasps and such emerge. They've been waiting in diapause in their nests through the entire winter. So it's sort of a hibernation. So the, on the left, you see an Andrina carlini. Andrina are uh, an or a genera of bees. They're a big one. They're one of the big families. And most of them are spring bees. A lot of them will emerge in April, um, waiting for everything to start blooming. And then the cherries and the plums and all of these early trees bloom. The maples are important for nectar. Um, and they, some of these ones, like this one, the Carlini, looks like a little tiny bumblebee. You won't mistake it for a bumblebee size-wise, because the only bumblebees at that time of year are queens. Um, the other one below is a sawfly. It's a tiny, tiny sawfly. It is a, um, sawflies are sort of primitive wasps. They were around before the wasps, but they're still around. Something to remember about getting early stuff out. This is a water leaf, and that's an early worker, Bamaculatus, very early in May. So she's out working hard. Uh, the queen has already established her, her, uh, her nest there. Um, so think about early stuff, even if it's trees. Trees are really, really important because of the blooms they provide, and you don't have to do a lot. Um, they will bloom every year. So here we have. On the left is a Calides bee, and this is a common one in this area only because there's one yard that has a very, very sandy fill. And she has literally hundreds of Calides and Aqualis nests in this yard. I talked to her a few years ago taking pictures and she, she loves her bees, so I'm glad to hear that. Um, they have one generation. They're done by early, by late June. They have done all the collecting they're going to do, and um, then they just hibernate through the rest of the season. So like most bees, they are solitary. Um, it's one female trying to make her way in this life. Uh, she digs her nest hole down several feet down below the frost line, and that's where she makes her little egg chambers and um, gets her larvae set up. Uh, this is on the little sour cherry tree we have in the yard. That pussy willow is constant in action. And this, you see here, this is pictures from April. These, these bees are out. That's a male Andrina from the same family, the same um, species. Uh, you can see he's got that big bushy mustache that's super common for Andrinas. Um, but he, so he is nectaring there. But the pussy willow, it only blooms for a couple of weeks, uh, but it is constantly buzzing with activity. Being along the fox, we get some birds. We get a nice migratory um, pathway here uh, in the yard. I'll see a lot of them down by the river. I'll see even more. Uh, we got some common visitors that come through. We're a bunch of the warblers. Uh, gross beaks we see pretty much every year for about three days, then they're gone. So somebody has gross beaks in their area, but it's not us. Uh, these, these are obviously taken with a longer lens than I do for the insects. So bumblebees I've spotted in our yard here, all of these species. Not every year, um, some of them not very common, but you see uh, Bombus affinis, oops, Bombus affinis down there. There's a male with some um, uh, milkweed bugs. The Vegans was uncommon. Um, you would come in for shooting star. I mean, for a blazing star, the liatris. So we'll have to see as I get more liatris established here, if we get more Vegans coming back. Um, the Citrinus you see there is a um, kleptoparasitic cuckoo bee. It does not make its own nests. It lays its eggs in other nests. And that Citrinus is actually kind of a rough one. It will kill the queen of that host nest and use the workers as long as they live to um, supply her own um, larvae. 
the rest of them all do their own stuff. Uh, the Oricomus is massive. If you know those big carpenter bees, the Xylocopa carpenter bees, the queens are larger, Oricomus queens are, and the workers are, are about that size, but they have a very, very small nest size, only 30 or so. Um, of course, each of those bees probably takes three or four times the resources to make than a little um, bimaculatus or impatiens, the more common ones. But this area has been really good. Uh, most years we see the Affinis here. Uh, Affinis is doing okay in the Chicago land area from what we can see. It seems to be um, doing okay in suburb areas. One thing you wanna do is, is look for nesting opportunities. I think it was about five years ago, we have a little um, raspberry patch as part of the vegetable garden back there. And I noticed that there were nesting bees in some of the canes that were cut as I was removing dead stock. So I stopped removing dead stock and started counting and about 30% of the dead stock uh, raspberry canes had Saratina bee nests in them. Even the ones I couldn't see, if I broke them open a little bit, I would discover them. So I stopped clearing those. I would still cut them off, but I would set them on a, in a bucket off to the side so that they would stay there. Um, or I would just clear it later on. But you know what raspberries are like. It's difficult to clear that stuff once that foliage is really growing. Um, Hoplitis is a little megachyle bee. If you look closely under the, her abdomen there, you'll see hair. That's called scopa, the specialized hair for um, bees carrying pollen. They carry it under the abdomen. So she could get probably five or six nest cells in this rose cane. Um, I only noticed it because um, it's right next to my grill and <laughs> right at eye level. So I got a few good pictures that year. I have seen hoplitis numerous times um, through the years since then. So they are in the area. It's pretty nice. Um, and they're small. They are only about oh, seven millimeters. Seratina are smaller. Talking about small bees, the Hylaeus bee you see on that milkweed uh, to the right, they also call them yellow face bees. If you look at the face, they've got, uh, she has uh, two little yellow panels. Uh, the male will have a, a bridging yellow between those two. These little ones are only about four millimeters long. They're tiny bees. Um, they nest everywhere. Uh, anywhere they can find a little protection, they'll wrap up an egg and the resources required for that larva um, in a polyester sh shell, essentially, um, and then go find another place. So when you see these um, nut hatches and creepers and such poking around under bark and such, they may be looking for these larvae. And at the bottom left, you see a Bombus impatiens queen searching for a spot. In a few months here, you're going to see the queens out in April, May. The first thing they have to do is find somewhere to live. So they have to find an unused mouse or, or other rodent um, hole or something like that where they can build their, their nest. They're big, they're fast, they don't stop for much. Uh, it's very difficult to get pictures of the queens. Um, you have to be really patient and find some, um, some plants that they really want the nectar from. In the summer, you get a lot of growth going. So you're gonna see a lot of blooming, a lot of foliage, a lot of things that are eating that foliage. And that should be something you look for in your yard. Um, here's a little cone-headed uh, plant hopper on the top right. He's gonna chew away at leaves. That's fine. That's what they're for. Um, any tree you see, and ginkgos are bad about this for the trees, uh, nothing eats ginkgos. So they provide no services here. And nobody wants to have the fruits anyway because they stink. So you only have male ginkgo trees around. Uh, dart moths, other moths. I don't have as many moth and butterfly photos in this presentation. Um, I need to, to do some more of that. But we do get them. We get some, never very many. Um, got a few monarchs coming around, uh, tons of beetles and such. And I'm not good at identifying beetles. Uh, so I send that stuff along to friends who can identify them for me. 
and I saw was it Terry Haney I think uh, mentioned wasps in the uh, the chat to begin with. There are a lot of wasps, and they are your friends. They are there are two types of wasps that are trouble. They're both introduced yellow jackets, uh, the European and German yellow jackets, um, and they're the ones that cause troubles. The rest of these, you'll never know they're around unless you go out to the flowers where they're feeding. It's rare to see them hunting. So Isodontia elegans is a grass carrying wasp. If you've ever opened up like your storm windows and seen this, this um, mass of grass that looks like it's been woven together, that's another wasp. That's what these wasps do. They, they, they weave these little, little um, tubes of grass and lay an egg in it and stock it with grasshopper prey primarily. So it's not a small wasp. The Bicertes hunt bugs. So stink bugs and all these kind of things. Um, that's what they're hunting. And that's a male on the rattlesnake master. Uh, beneath it is a mycenium wasp. Uh, and they parasitize bugs, uh, grubs in the ground. Uh, they're pretty fascinating. I see them a lot. Uh, we have plenty of bugs uh, and beetle grubs in the ground. And then this other one at the bottom is one of the square headed wasps. Uh, these guys you'll see hunting, zipping around in your garden. And um, they're hard to get pictures of because they're always on the move, hunting for uh, immature crickets and other things like that. They, again, they parasitize those and take them back to their, their nest and um, feed them to their young. Some more wasps. Um, here we go. And a lot of these are, are hunters as well. So the, they hunt beetles like the Aminis. Uh, there's a mud dauber. We're all familiar with mud daubers. Mostly these guys hunt spiders and other soft bodied things. Uh, the bee wolf down below on the goldenrod hunts bees and wasps, paralyzes them, takes them home. And the Sphex ichneumonius, the, uh, the great golden digger wasps, these girls are big. They're about two inches long and they're beautiful orange and black. Um, they hunt katydids, adult katydids. They will subdue them, paralyze them, drag them home. Uh, so there's a lot of drama going on. Something is always hunting and eating something else out in your garden. There are also predatory flies. Um, <laughs> I say mostly because down at the bottom here is a mantid fly, which is not a fly and it's not a mantid. It's a relative of lace wings. Um, lace wings are notoriously excellent hunters of things like aphids and such. These mantids hunt spiders, which is pretty cool. These little mantid flies. Uh, this is the only time I have ever seen them. I'm sure they're around, but they're very hard to spot. As you can see, their camouflage is exquisite. Robber flies, some of these look like bumblebees. And uh, this one hung around for a couple of weeks on this uh, while the elderberry was blooming. Um, the little long legged fly on that milkweed leaf. Get out in the garden, you will see tons of these little things zipping around hunting little stuff, mostly aphids. And then the parasitic um, fly you see up the top, it actually grabs a bee or a wasp in the air. And then that unusual abdomen, you can see the ovipositor there. It will pry open a couple of the plates on the abdomen and deposit an egg beneath that. And then the fly's larva eats that bee or wasp and makes new ones. All right, something a little less violent here, more bees. Um, there are some plants you can put out there that will always draw stuff. Echinacea at the bottom, you can see there's a little Helictus legatus, which is actually not a little Helictus, it's one of the larger ones, but bumblebees are just very, very large. Um, I think that's a, um, that's a Griseocolis. It's a pretty common early species. Uh, the Lassia glossum is a very, very wide family of bees. Uh, you can see that on the Jacob's Ladder there which produces a ton of pollen once you look at them. Um, 
but they're very tiny bees. They're only about five millimeters long at most. There's another mega kyle up on that ironweed. And if you can plant ironweed, I highly recommend it. Um, it's another one of those later season asters that just is a huge draw and the color is fantastic. This is probably mega kyle pugnata. I'm not certain about that. Um, it's a female, uh, another one that collects the pollen beneath their abdomen. They really like this plant. I see them on this constantly. Um, and then another, and this is a mistake. It's not a mega kyle by maculata. That's a melasodes by maculata. Uh, female on hyssop. Hyssop will draw a lot of stuff, if nothing else, for nectar. Um, so I don't have a lot of it, but I always have some of it around. I want to talk a little bit about specialist bees. Um, true specialist bees will want pollen from one plant or one family of plants. There are uh, ones that are kind of oligo specialists that will like from a, an entire a broader range of plants. So we'll go from the top here. This is Pepinapus pruinosa, literally in Greek, pepon squash apis bee. Illinois here is a big pumpkin and, and squash plant uh, state. We, it's a, one of our biggest cash crops is pumpkin for Libby's pumpkin filling and that kind of stuff. Um, even in your gardens, uh, you're gonna find these specialist squash bees uh, because there are a lot of native squash plants. Uh, they don't look like much, but they are out there. Um, and even stuff like morning glories that have the same sort of shape, they like those. So this is a male. I've only ever seen males. They will sleep in that squash overnight. Um, that squash flower opens up very early. The females are out pretty much before dawn. And in the summertime, that's really early. So I'm rarely out there to see it. The fact that the male is waiting there means that the females are likely to come around and they nest very close to the sources. So in the big pumpkin patches and such, they may bring in honeybees, but likely the pollination has been done already. And the honeybees are just gathering nectar. So Pepinapus, they're goofy little guys. Um, Andrina rudbeckia, another Andrina, uh, which is a, which I've mentioned a couple times and we'll keep mentioning here. Uh, this is specialist on the rudbeckia family plants. And if you have enough of them around, you may draw the rudbeckias. Um, and the other Andrina down there here to Sinkta kind of confused me because it looks very much like a bumblebee. Um, but it, I knew it wasn't for a couple of reasons, partially because it does not collect its pollen in saddlebags, but more like most other bees just on a massive scopa on the legs. Um, and the head shape is wrong for a bumblebee. Uh, for a bumblebee. So I, I eventually did get this uh, identified as Hirdesincta, and it's a late season Andrina that specializes on aster flam, family plants. You can see it's on goldenrod here, one of the small flower asters. And then the Melisodes, the longhorn bees. This is a female Trinotis. It's one I can recognize by sight. The Melisodes are part of a group called Eucerini, and they are specialists on these sunflower type plants. You'll see them on other stuff as well, but a lot of them live for this time of year. This is when they come out. Uh, you can see she has a lot of pollen built up. Um, the males they call, they get the name longhorns because their antennas are about as long as the bodies. They're hard to miss. And the male ones will actually sleep in the flowers. A lot of male bees will sleep on the flowers, you see. Um, they don't get to go home at night, they have to camp out. Their job is to disperse. So if you get out in the garden, look under leaves, look under flowers and such, you'll probably see male bees sleeping. We'll talk about the green bees a little bit. There's a few uh, groups of these uh, green helictus bees. The largest of them in our area anyway is Agapostamon. The Agapostamon varesins or, or the Varesin green metallic bee is really common. Uh, they have a black and white striped abdomen and a green thorax and head. There's another Agapostamon that is all green. 
Um, they're very common visitors. The other super common one is on the right there, Agachlorapira. There's a, another species that is uh, Agachlora. Um, and the only way to really tell the difference at site is, is a couple color differences. Um, but they're super common. The Agachlorella at the bottom right, um, you can see they're kind of bronzy green. They're smaller. They're a little shyer. They're not as common. Um, but they are fairly common. There are a lot of them around. Um, one thing you can see is if you're walking past or, or seeing a lot of little bees buzzing around, those are going to be the males. The females have a job to do. They're going to land. They're going to collect their pollen and nectar and such. But the males will nectar up just for energy. Uh, so they're buzzing around. They're territorial is all get out. It's just amazing to watch them. At the bottom left is something um, that we didn't think was around the area, it was an Augochloropsis, but pretty much everywhere I look now, I, I find these little ones. You can see the ends of their legs are white, and that's a giveaway for this species. And I actually don't think this is a morning glory, this is something else, but it's a, one of those cone-shaped flowers. Um, this is a male. Um, and they are really tiny. They're only about four millimeters long. So that dogwood I mentioned earlier, it produces a lot of berries. Um, and everything comes in for it. Wax wings, but I thought these ones were pretty interesting. I would not have expected a kingbird to come in, but kingbirds come in. There's no missing them. They are noisy little guys. Um, they had their fill. Robins, finches, uh, catbird there. I like the photo. Catbird is not happy I'm taking this picture. The other ones didn't really care. Um, our dogs eat these berries too, and I tried them, and they, they do taste a lot like blueberries, but they're very astringent. Um, with like blood, green tea gives that drying effect. That's astringency. Um, service berries are much more tasty. So if I had a choice, I'd put service berries in. I'm going to break from my, my um, format a little bit and do some larger photos. We have a lot of predators that come through the yard. A lot of damselflies and dragonflies come in. Um, these guys, these ebony jewel wings, are a common creek. Uh, they're they're um, larvae mature in the creeks instead of ponds or something. And they emerge and we see a bunch of them in the yard for a few days or a couple of weeks, then they've moved on. Um, they have these black wings. I know you can't see it's black because the background is, is nicely underexposed, um, but they're hard to miss. They're impossible to miss as those black wings flutter along. I think this one is just newly hatched that Eye color is red. That's not the, the color that they will be um, as adults. But that body color is that brilliant green. Uh, it's, it's, they're amazing. And they're pretty big, so they're hard to miss. Um, I know if you go out to Anderson Japanese Gardens in Rockford, the creek that goes through there, they have ebony jewel wings flying around. And some like little wood cedar butterflies. One aspect I didn't talk about a little bit here is um, parasitism among bees. So each family of bees has its own kleptoparasites. On the right on that geranium is a nomada. And you can see these look like wasps. They don't have the hair because they're not collecting their own pollen. And their coloration is bright like a wasp because they, it's probably advantageous for them to have that kind of go away look to them uh, because they also don't have stingers. Um, Namata are parasitic on the Andrina. So early in the season, you'll see them digging around looking for Andrina nest holes. And then when the Andrina female flies off, they'll zip down there, lay a couple of their own eggs and go away. Um, I see something about the catbird. Um, the Ipolini is a parasite for the uh, Melisodes, I think, if I'm right. Um, that's on a daisy flea bean, so they're not big. 
no, it's a helictus. That's right. It's a helictus um, kleptoparasite. So really, they're they're not parasites on the on the uh, the bee itself. They're parasites of the nest. So uh, they they're called pollen parasites or pollen thieves, that sort of thing. But they're sort of thieves. They don't run away with it. They stay there. Living along the river has its advantages as well. Uh, every so often we get to see some uh, wood ducks come through, which is just a thrill for us. And um, here's a little toad we found um, weeding. This might be the toad that stuck around all year long and our young husky uh, would pick up once in a while. She never heard it. Um, I don't think she knew what to do with it. Um, but it, it matured and it stayed around and I'm sure it went back to the creek every so often. We have a lot of dragonflies, but this was a different one for us. I, I had never seen a pond hawk here in the yard. They lay their eggs and they, their larvae mature in ponds. So not in uh, the creeks that are nearby here. Uh, it stuck around for a few days, um, then went off. Uh, they're big. Um, well, they're, they're three inches or so. It was really cool to see it. Uh, my bad uh, formatting shot here. So let's talk through them. Here's, you can just see the little Lassie Glossum on some wild onion. I had some of the plants that we put in, um, I'd forgotten that there were wild onion. Um, I kept it, expecting them to uh, bloom as uh, blue eye grass, but then I looked at it and it's not. Um, I was really happy to have wild onions. They produce flowers for a good amount of time um, and they are very good nectar sources. So you will see bumblebees, honeybees, everything using them for nectar. Um, this little Lassia glossum is gathering pollen here um, and uh, taking that home. Liatris, we have a couple species of liatris in the yard. Oh, uh, and um, it'll draw a lot of stuff. Uh, we do get a fair amount of skippers, both the larger ones and smaller ones. Um, other butterflies, we get a few, but we get a lot of skippers. Um, water leaf, if you have a chance to plant water leaf, it'll take some shade. Uh, it's done by mid year. Um, and um, it's just the bumblebees just love it. This little fly here, um, Dresta festiva, I like the name and it's gorgeous. It's a specialist on giant ragweed. So it's essentially a fruit fly that lays its egg in ragweed fruit. And we've had issues with ragweed in the, in the, in the yard and ragweed is not going away. So these flies are probably doing just fine. They're really cute too. Other stuff eating, um, summertime stuff and the, the bellwort doesn't really belong in summertime, but I found a spot for the flower picture here. Uh, lots of beetles. Uh, Serotina, that's on a blue lobelia. If you'll see the bumblebees on it, they, they grab onto it and they put their glossa, their tongue down inside it. The Serotinas are small enough, they have to climb down inside these things. Uh, the bottom right flower is a, a um, Illinois bundle flower. And I, I got these two plants from um, Remick over at College of DuPage planted them in. And then when I was doing a walk over there with uh, his class, he said, oh yeah, they, they don't let that seed. It, it just spreads so aggressively. It's like, why did you give me that? So I collect all the seeds off of that thing. I've yet to decide whether I'm going to do anything with them. Um, it's in the mimosa family. So the protein content of the, the foliage is pretty high. So deer really like it. So maybe I'll try to figure out somewhere in the neighborhood to plant it and keep the deer out of my yard, give them something there they can eat on their own. Show you the size difference here. Um, I think you can see the little Lassia glossum bee in front of this bumblebee on a culver's root. Um, culver's root is a good plant in the yard too. It's doing really well. The, um, you can see the size difference. The Lassia glossum are some of our smallest bees and bumblebees are among our largest. Another shot of an agapostomon varescens. This is a male this time. Um, 
You can see all that bright yellow coloration on them. Um, hyssop will bring them in because they're just after nectar. Another shot of Culver's root there with the um, Lassia glossum. False indigo and a lot of villages, the villages here, Carpentersville, West Dundee, East Dundee are putting in false indigo. I would like to see them put in Baptista, but this is a good resource anyway. Um, and it's flood tolerant. It's been flooded. It's been underwater a couple of times back there. It does really well. The, um, the flowers need a heavier bee to get and open them up. If you have a chance to, you can pull them open and expose. You can see uh, some of the anthers there um, and the bees will come on. Now the carpenter bees don't have a long tongue necessary to get nectar out of these. So they will slice into the back of the flower and lick nectar out of the back. That's called um, nectar thieving. I guess I should mention that uh, bees can have long or short tongues. Uh, long tongues can get into long flowers. Short tongues are more efficient at kind of grazing. Honeybees have a short tongue. Honeybees also cannot buzz pollinate. Bumblebees and some of the Holictus species can buzz pollinate, literally vibrate their bodies um, using the muscles that uh, would beat their wings. They can kind of semi-detach those muscles, vibrate their body and, and get that pollen out of structures um, to protect it. So if you think of your tomato plants, your pepper plants, any of the nightshades um, and the native varieties of nightshades and such that require pollen, buzz pollination, and I really should get some pictures in here showing that. Um, it's bumblebees that are going to do it, not honeybees. Anyway, um, indigo is a lot of fun. Um, it's an early bloomer. So you'll see those early species, including some queens on it once in a while. Back to parasitism and symbiosis. Um, when you talk about specialty insects that are specialists on certain plants, there's a symbiosis there. Um, they have really built that up. This is a megachyle um, on salvia. And I only see this species and I have not been able to get an identification for it. Um, on salvia and hyssop, so in that family of plants. So it's after that kind of structure of flower. Uh, to the left is Stella louise, it's a parasitic bee in the megachyle family. And you notice it looks like a potter wasp. You have to look really close to know that it's not a potter wasp. And that's almost certainly uh, a case of, converge, of um, color mimicry there. Um, they are in that same family as the megachyles. So when you see enough parasitic species around, it's an indication that, that the host population is healthy enough to support them. So they're actually a good thing to see around. So some lessons I've learned through this project of, of trying to get these, this yard into shape to support stuff is that it, it is a lot of work. Um, know that going into it. Uh, you need to get out early to pull plants that you don't want there, which means you have to learn the foliage of the plants you do want there. Um, and not everything grows everywhere. I have trouble getting stuff like swamp milkweed and some of the other milkweeds to grow here. It just doesn't do well. Um, so I'll grow something else. Um, not everything is appropriate everywhere. We had those big elderberry and they took up a ton of space and would just kind of spread around. And the berries aren't, or the berries are a little on the toxic side until they're cooked. So if you cook them, you can make jam or distill it into Sambuca. But um, I didn't want the dogs trying to eat it. Fortunately, they hadn't. Um, Plant appropriately for the region, just because something is native doesn't mean it's native to there. Um, it also depends on what you want to have around. So um, you can see a couple more pictures here. Uh, Pattered Dancer is another damselfly that I don't get to see often. I'll see it out in the prairies, but I've never seen it before this year uh, in the yard. And our white crown sparrows come and visit us every, every spring. Uh, they stick around for a few weeks and then they rough north 
they're always fun to see though they 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 are really not shy at all they let me take good pictures of them so what's next for my yard uh, we need to reestablish the vegetable garden uh, flood a couple years back that i keep talking about uh, killed off most of the raspberry so we've got to reestablish that but it did let us get in there and and do some work and um, do that we've got raised beds but still we get a lot of weeds that grow in there that i don't want um, i need to prune some trees again uh, open up some of the the yard from shade um, there's a huge void left after the elderberries were removed um, they found a good home we have a, a friend who's a um, a landscaper um, who does stuff over at um, uh, Elgin Community College and other places. So he'll find a nice ditch to put them in. Um, I'm going to make some plant ID signs for the stuff I have out front. I've got geranium maculatum. I've got spider warts and some um, Jacob's ladders and a nice red bud. And I actually put a button bush out front that took place of a little um, tree that wasn't doing well. <laughs> The, uh, the raspberries, I saw that comment come up. The raspberries that uh, we had in there were all, were all, not volunteers, but they were all donated. And they have, I have donated so many raspberries to other people as well. Um, they're black raspberries, they are delicious. Um, I'm going to also pursue the conservation home status. Now, I think it's hard to see on that dill, but even your vegetable gardens and your decorative type plants can be good resources. Um, there, up front, you see a little Hylaeus bee. And if you look close, you'll see a bunch of other bees and flies. Um, dill is great. Uh, and that parsley family uh, plants are, um, they're host plants too. We, I battled um, parsnip, the invasive parsnip here a few years ago, and it drew so much stuff. Um, I finally got rid of it by, as soon as the blooms were done, I snipped them off and eventually I, I pulled all the plants. Um, maybe I'll grow edible parsley. That stuff grew really well. Uh, keep it in the garden though. Uh, sunflowers, of course, you'll see all sorts of stuff on sunflowers. Uh, the bumblebees will find it. All the other bees will find it. Melisodes will find it. Uh, I'd like to see some more pictures of people doing it. So what, are, what do I need to do soon here? Uh, process more photos. I have such a backlog. I don't even have any pictures of spiders in this presentation. Um, I have more pictures of spiders from prairies and such than I do from my yard, but I've found some good ones back there. I wanna do some nighttime photography. I've done some um, long exposures for fireflies and such. And once I get my neighbors to turn all their lights out, I'll be able to do better. Uh, we had a couple that, that came in and decided they needed to leave their lights on all night. They don't. Um, and I need to figure out what else I can do to help the Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths, because they're in a bad shape. Um, you'll see early on in your maple trees and pussy willows and other willow trees and such, the butterflies that have overwintered in, your, in the leaf litter and such, they overwinter as adults. So things like morning cloaks, the admirals, the commas, um, question marks, all those family ones. Um, they, they spent the winter burrowed down into leaves and stuff. And this is why we're telling you not to, to um, disturb the leaves any more than you, you have to. Um, and it doesn't really matter to them what leaves they are. They're just leaves. So if you can leave the mess, rake the leaves off your lawn into those open areas it'll build soil and it will um, helpfully keep uh, the, the, the stuff that's uh, living down in there over the winter uh, nice and warm um, so leave the mess the stalks and such there's a lot of things that live in the stalks uh, plus we all know the seeds from a lot of these plants are food sources for the birds uh, contribute to citizen science um, a good one is called um, Lost Ladybug Project. Um, the Asian ladybugs have devastated our native ladybug um, population. I usually only see a couple of them. Um, talk to your neighbors. Let them know what you're doing. 
uh, especially the kids. The kids see a lot of this in the school. They don't necessarily see a lot of it in the yard. So get them in, have a look at. Uh, people are afraid of wasps and bees and they don't need to be. I get out there playing with the hornets and stuff and they, they don't sting. Um, and learn about the stuff and the communities they support. So do as much as you can. Um, for the birds, if you don't have a fresh water source nearby, consider a bird bath, but keep it clean. Absolutely keep it clean. Um, and you'll do well. And part of the format loss was I lost my end slides. So I'm going to say thank you for showing up to this. And um, we can open this up for questions. I can right. stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Terry. That was fantastic. What a great mass of information there was there on, on insects, on native plants, their relationships. That was really great. I, I really, really enjoyed that. So thank you. Um, oh, that's right. Thank you, Jane Grillo. Fertilleries. We do see fertilleries show up once in a while. I want to see more fertilleries show up once in a while. The um, very large black, I'm going to go through the questions if you don't mind, Jane. Yeah, or I can read them to you and we can okay. kind of have a conversation. Okay, that, might on be, them. that might be easier. You want to do that? All right. Um, so Marilyn says, I have a patch of gooseneck. Each year for a while, they're filled with very large, completely black wasps that are very well behaved. Do you have any idea what they could be? That is almost certainly Sphex pensylvanicus, the giant black wasp. Um, they are, and the, the males are small, about half the size, but the females are huge they hunt katydids uh, other grasshoppers as well and locusts but they really look for katydids and they are very well behaved i wanted to throw in a comment too you mentioned the the ichnomonas or ichnomon Sphex, yeah yeah the sphex and i there was one year i must have gotten two or three calls from people about these where they would send me pictures and say oh my gosh what is this thing it's gonna kill me and my family <laughs> <laughs> and so i had like i had to look it up myself and learn a little bit more about it they are fascinating yeah like terrifying and kind of gory but fascinating so there's that whole group the sphex wasps um they they are like that there's sphex nudis the nude sphex, which I guess is less colorful, but it's still orange and black. It's still pretty. Um, and they all hunt those sort of grasshopper type um, insects. And they're large. So they're, yeah, well, they're really yeah. cool to see. And I think that's why people were freaking out about them so much is because they are so large. And there was one that was nesting by a front door or something. They kept seeing it flying in and out and they were afraid it was going to sting somebody. And I had you know looked up and it says, no, as a matter of fact, they are... They really don't sting you unless you're a grasshopper. And if you are a grasshopper, be terrified. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Barb Ferry wants to know, is there a host plant for the long-legged fly? I have a monarch butterfly garden and have seen these, but would like to have more to dine on the aphids. So I don't think, I don't know. Um, I'm going to have to look at that. I know it's a very big family. And I see them constantly, so they must be doing well enough. Flies, if it, there's any students out there um, who want to do something, study flies. They are, there are many, many species where they know the adults, but they don't know where they're laying their eggs or anything like that. Oh, interesting. And if you're looking for predators for aphids, Obviously, ladybugs are a very big one. That's the one we talk about the most. Um, do you know of any other predators for uh, aphids? Yeah, um, lacewings are big ones. Lacewings will eat them. Oh, yeah. um, there's, there's a lot of the little predatory be type beetles and such. Late, aphids are kind of the snack bar of the, of the garden. Everything <laughs> eats them. Um, the um, what else is out there that, that'll do the number on them? Um, some of the, I think some of the other flies and wasps will eat them too. So, snack yeah. bar, I like that. Yeah, and I've I've had I've had aphids just devastate the swamp milk we had back there. They do. It was done. So, okay, fine. Yeah, <laughs> just plant extra next time. Yeah. Kim says, while we're on the topic of, of 
predatory things. When it comes to nightshades, we have a lot of trouble with Colorado potato bugs in the vegetable garden. Last year, we had good success with diatomaceous earth, but I worry about its effects mm. on bumblebees and other beneficial insects. Do you have any suggestions? I don't know that the the, the earth, the uh, you mean that you dust the, yeah. the plant with it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any idea if that affects them at all. Uh, yeah, personally, I'm not sure either. I generally, DE has more of an effect on soft bodied things because that's the whole thing is it's got sharp edges. So it slices mm -hmm. the body of soft bodied insects. Um, and the bees are only interested them. in the flower as well. They're not interested in the foliage. Right. So as long as they're not nesting in that area, I would think it would be fine. Mm. Um, again, I'm not 100% on that, but yeah. Based on trying to connect the dots in my head, that's that's what I would think. Um, let's see. Sandra says, are the sunflowers you have in your yard allelopathic to other plants? That I don't know. We don't have a lot of sunflowers. Uh, we'll plant them like in the vegetable garden area in, a, in an unused or disused um, box there. Um, or they grow beneath the bird feeder. Yeah, there. It's a great source of food for birds and and insects alike. I think. I don't know if there's any allopathy with it or not. Um, I would like to get something like sawtooth sunflowers or one of the native ones to uh, just have a small patch here. Yeah. One of the other challenges is is I'm I've got to get rid of some stuff that is growing, that like trumpet vines and such that I'm mm -hmm. going to have to take pesticide to to kill it. Sometimes um, you just don't have a choice. I may yeah. have to nuke the entire area and start over uh, to get rid of the stuff. Uh, and one of those, um, one of those things as well as now I lost my train of thought. Oh well, um, just providing some some other stuff. Now I forgot what I was going to say, so let's go on. Okay, moving on. <laughs> um, Kathy wants to know if you have a source for water leaf. I have it in my yard. I have fought with Kelsey Shaw at Possibility Place. He says they won't sell it because it's too aggressive, but yet they turn around and sell uh, Virginia Creeper. So he and I have, have some differing <laughs> opinions there, but um, I have a little patch of water leaf in my yard. It is very well behaved. It's a great ground cover in shady areas. So personally, I like it. Um, and I know I bought it at a plant sale. I want to say it was the DuPage County plant sale in the mm -hmm. spring, which I'm going to guess they got their things maybe from Midwest ground covers. I would have to check their stock though. Midwest ground, like I said, I know possibility place, which is usually my go-to in my area for native plants. I, I'm sure they're not carrying it, but I'm thinking maybe Midwest ground covers might. Oh, and the, the aggressiveness it hasn't been aggressive at all in our area. Um, I think it's it only been here for a couple is. of years. Um, for like three years now. What what is aggressive is Monarda, and that's what what that oh, yeah. comes back. And I'm gonna have to remove big sections of Monarda and just keep mm -hmm. it in a couple places. Yeah, and I have uh it's not mountain mint, it's uh oh no, it's uh an aster. I have an aster in my yard that the aster and the monarda have just tried to take over this entire patch. Yeah. So it it's uh pull them out, it, you know. There, it's a game, there's plenty yeah. of asters. I call it, it nice recondoing. Yeah, it is nice to see when out walking the dogs that these like hairy asters and even New England asters are just popping up in the open areas. Oh, like, yeah. oh nice. It's like, exactly. well, our dogs are doing their job at transporting seeds around. So yeah. <laughs> and Bonnie mentions too mountain mint. That's another one that's <sighs> that's really great for pollinators. I love the way it smells. Can be a little aggressive, so you gotta watch where you put it. But if it's in an area with lots of competition it should be okay. Um, let's see. Sandra wants to confirm, uh, squash bees pollinate pumpkins before honeybees? Squash bees are, um, the females are collecting it early in the morning, before dawn. Okay. So you will never see, if you ever get a chance to look at them, um, all bees have three primitive eyes between their big compound eyes called ocelli, and theirs are huge. Uh, because they're out at night, it's an early morning, out before dawn, um, and they're very efficient pollinators of the uh, of those squash. So it's it's been suspected in entomology circles that 
people are paying for honeybees to come out to pollinate. Uh, and, and the bees that are doing most of the work are living right there in the fields with their squash. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And, you know, we always think of honeybees as being this number one pollinator, but we have so many native bees. I, um, I was reading three to 4,000 species of native there, bees here in Illinois. In, in this Southern Lake Michigan region, the census uh, recently done is about 400 bee species. Okay. Uh, 4,000 in the U.S. Okay. But like half of those are desert bees. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I probably misremembered my statistic, but. Um, yeah. Okay. So just so FYI, there, there are about 24,000 bee species worldwide. And we have okay. about 4,000 in North America. And bees like honeybee, a lot of these are, they're very generally smaller um, uh, geographical range, but some of them are really wide general range. Um, we're lucky to have some of them around that um, are, are uh, super pollinators of the early prune uh, and rose family um, sort of uh, trees like the andrinas. If you go out to the, uh, the forests and such, you'll see a lot of the black cherry trees and wild native plum trees and such. And it's those andrina that are doing the job out there. All right, looking through some of these other questions here. Um, looks like we have some young viewers. Clay, who is six years old, has two questions for you. He wants to know what is your favorite bug and what is the largest wasp in Illinois? The largest, well, I think largest probably means a couple things. Um, the Sphex pennsylvanicus, the giant black wasp is probably the longest wasp. Uh, I think the cicada killer probably outmasses it though. They're okay. bulky and they have to subdue cicadas and, and fly them back to their homes. So they have to be pretty strong flyers. Yeah, you gotta be pretty big for that. Yep. Um, favorite bug. I have a vinyl decal I made of uh, Bombus oricomus on the back of my car. Yeah. So okay. that is that really big bumblebee. The, the th second and third um, abdominal segments are yellow. They're, they're hard to miss. So I, I guess find... I have to say that if I've got a decal in my car. <laughs> <laughs> and I find it really interesting that in the insect world, especially like with, with bees, that we're using that binomial, that genus and species name for them. A lot of these don't have common names. Right. You know, in the plant world, every plant's got a common name and it, it causes a lot of difficulties because sometimes two plants have the same common name or different people call mm -hmm. things different things. Um, but, I, but I find it very interesting that so many of these, because probably they look so similar or it's hard to tell them apart, they just don't have common names. Yeah. And I'm sure Oricomus has a common name. I'm sure all these bumblebees have common names, but I just, I rarely remember them. But there's a lot of the stuff I don't remember scientific names for, you know. So we, yeah. we're all a mixed bag. I mean, of course, you can't be an expert at everything. And some of these species, like these little hyleas and Lassia glossum, you can't tell the species of that bee unless you dissect it under a stage microscope. Yeah, you know, they're they're looking at genitalia. They're looking at you know taking bits of the bee apart to tell the species of it. Wow. Yeah or counting hairs between the eyes, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, that, that would get difficult to do without having a yeah. subdued species in front of you. So you'll get a family, you'll get a tribe, you'll get okay. that kind of thing. All right, so another question is, uh, so you mentioned just because something is native doesn't mean it's native to your region. However, our urban area with buildings and trees creating shade is in a high dry prairie. So is it okay to plant species that are native to other growing conditions within a hundred miles of here, east mostly? Otherwise we're having nothing in our wet shady areas. Yeah, so suitability is a wide thing because you can have, you know, two blocks away is totally different from where you are now. Um, so I think regional is fine. Uh, we get stuff pop up probably out of, uh, we had a um, buffalo, um, what was it, Buffalo Dock or something like that popped up once. I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> it's native to the U.S., but not native to here. Um, and um, yeah, I think if you can get those things growing, your terrain is, maybe that's Mesic Prairie there. It's not going to get much water at all. So put sandy plants in. 
Um, one of the ones that we've had surprised me in the yard has done so well is Rattlesnake Master. That's a great I one. wouldn't have thought that this soil would have been good for it because it is more of a mesic plant. We'll have to see if they survive the, the inevitable floods that come every so often. I don't want to make it sound like our yard is always underwater, but um, it it's going to happen again. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's a thing you have to be aware of and you have to plan mm -hmm. for. Uh, the one in my yard, I'll say that that I was surprised has lasted and there's a whole long story behind it, but I actually have eastern prickly pear in my yard. Oh, nice. And it, it came from a plant that actually came from my childhood home, which is not far from where I currently live. And when I moved out, I took a couple of pads with me and it has moved two houses with us now. And so I have a great big patch of Eastern prickly pear that just happens to really like my yard for some reason. I get nice big flowers on it. It's gorgeous. It is a pain to try and weed around. <laughs> However, uh, yeah, my husband and I use rock, paper, scissors to see who's going to have to do the weeding around the cactus. But um you know, it's it's whatever works for your yard. Sometimes there are factors that that you're not even aware of that play into it, whether it's your soil composition, um, the the bacteria in the soil. I mean, there's tons of things that play into whether or not plants are going to be successful. Some of them are easier to measure than others. You know, it's easy to see is this shady or sunny? Is it wet? Is it dry? But is the bacteria composition of that soil suitable for mm -hmm. this plant? the only way to know is to try it. So uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, let's see, any invasive insects we should try to discourage? Well, I mean, discouraging insects is, is, is almost impossible. <laughs> um, Japanese beetles are invasive. You're not gonna kill them by dusting everything with seven. Um, the uh, Japanese multicolored um, ladybugs are invasive. They're terrible. Um, as an aside, they're, they're wiping out our native ones. Um, and it's, it's not that they eat them, they, they have a parasite that they lay and it, the parasite stays in their eggs and ladybugs tend to eat each other's eggs. So that wipes them out because they have no resistance to it. So you're never going to get rid of all of those. You're never going to get, I, for the first time this year, I found the giant um, resin bee, Megachyle sculpturalis, found a male in the yard. We saw one over at James Woolworth Prairie as well. Uh, Alan took that as a sample because um, we had never seen it. So those are coming along. They don't seem to be a problem. Uh, there are wasps that, will, that specialize on scarab beetles. Um, the dubia, um, what is it? Um, they're scolid wasps, so it's the scolia dubia. Uh, the blue-winged wasp is what they call it. They're gorgeous, and they specialize on scarabs, not just our native scarabs, but Japanese beetles too. So I would think they would be doing well, but I haven't seen one in the yard, just on prairies. Oh, cool. I, if it's the one that I think it is, I have seen some of those in my yard. They're super cool. Do they like flick their abdomens up and down a lot? A lot of wasps will do that and okay. they'll flip their wings there. So uh, it, you might be thinking of the cricket killer, the steel blue cricket be. killer. They're That's all black. And, thinking of. Yeah. And they're always flicking their wings as they're hunting. Yeah. So they're the female um, steel blue cricket killer. And the name is, is escaping me at the moment is about the size of the male Sphex Pennsylvanicus. Okay. But they're not, the Sphexes are black. They're not they don't have any blue really to them. Well, while we're talking about identifying things, Chris says she's got some Bombas pictures that she's looking for help identifying. So do you have any recommendations for where she could go to help get them identified? Yeah, so if you are in Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, or Ohio, you can send pictures and put entries to Bug uh, Bee Spotter. It's out of the University of Illinois. Just type Bee Spotter and we'll identify them. Fantastic. One one sighting per, per sighting. Don't put four different bees in the same sighting or four different times in the same spotting. Okay. Um, it's just, or I'll have to kick it back. 
there, um, I do know there are also some Facebook groups that are good on identifying insects as well. Mm -hmm. um, in this area, bee spotter is probably for the best. If you're outside the bee spotter area, then, um, you know. So just... you've got um, bug guide is really nice. iNaturalist is nice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how, I don't use iNaturalist, but I use bug guide all the time. Okay. I have used iNaturalist more on plants mm. and, and it's really good. So um, definitely recommend that one too. Um, all right. Gone just over our time a little bit more, but if, if you'll indulge, there is one more question in here I wanted to get to. Uh, Karen says, you mentioned putting stick cuttings in a bucket. I pile mine into a brush pile. Do they need to be vertical? No, I don't think so. So in the spring, they're going to abandon it and they won't reuse that. So I just want to not throw them in the mulch or not get them trampled or anywhere. So I just put them somewhere protected. Okay. Yeah. And that's, uh, you mentioned leaving the leaves, which is a really big thing. We have another webinar on our YouTube channel that we did earlier on that. If, you're, if that's something you're interested in, please check that out. Um, we are so big on getting rid of everything in our yards. It's really bad for our native insects. So if you can leave the cuttings, if you have to cut them, you know, leave a, about 15 inches and then, you know, cut a, above 15 inches and then just let it lay on the ground. It helps protect the ground, it helps to, to insulate your plants and protect them. It acts almost like a sponge to help slowly water your plants in the spring. Um, it's just, it's really good for our yards. And yeah, and remember that's how topsoil is made exactly. by slowly decomposing this organic matter. And topsoil, it takes what, like a hundred years to grow a half inch or something like that. The way it decomposes, it takes a long yeah. time. So this stuff will decompose, it'll turn into, and stuff will eat it. So right. there's a lot of decomposers we could talk about. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. So definitely, um, you know, it pays to be lazy in the fall. Who knew? So, you know, take care of your yard, leave your leaves, leave your plant cuttings, let these beautiful insects have a place to overwinter um, and have a great winter. It can yep, enjoy we got it about five winter. months until the butterflies show up. That's right. That's right. So I want to thank you, Terry. This has been hugely informative. Absolutely loved it. Um, really appreciate you talking to us. So hopefully you'll talk with us again sometime. We can we could set up something else. Hope yeah. you had a good time too. Thank you all for attending today. Again, I can't say it enough. I really appreciate all of you coming out to watch us every Wednesday. Um, and don't forget, next Wednesday is going to be all about telling nature stories. So join us for our last webinar of 2020. And I will see you all again later. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Terry. Bye.